Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to our hybrid presidential session on Haiti beyond Saint-Domingue. Um, I'm really sorry that I'm not there with you in person, although I'm also happy <laughs> to be um, with my family at home. But as a member of the program committee, I helped put together some of your sessions, and I'm really sorry that I'm not there um, to see them and hear them, but I'm grateful that I can participate remotely, and I want to let you all know that this panel is being recorded. It's one of the sessions recorded for H France Salon, um, so other people not here will be able to see this afterwards because the program committee thought this was an important topic. So presidential sessions were sessions organized by the program committee to feature cutting edge work. And this is one I'm really thrilled to present. Haiti Beyond Saint-Domingue is part of a larger effort to think about the state of the field in French and Francophone history in 2022. Um, and the panel asks, how can we do a better job of centering the perspectives of colonized peoples and their descendants rather than doing a more perfunctory kind of colonial history that drops into Haiti for a short while while centering white French colonists. Um, indeed, when French historians think about Haiti, they are often only interested in the French colonial period without examining changes or continuities from periods before or after. Um, and many of those who've presented on Haiti at FHS in the past have done so from backgrounds of training in French history. So had, as has been discussed in other sessions this year, and I look forward to hearing more about them later, our society has not always been welcoming to scholars of color, um, and, and scholars of color at, at FHS have sometimes faced microaggressions and not returned, which has made our society more insular. And thus, when scholars have presented um, at FHS on colonial topics like Saint-Domingue, unfortunately, I have to say, it has often been to all white or almost all white audiences. In addition, many white historians who work on colonial Saint-Domingue from French history have not been in dialogue with Haitian or Haitian American colleagues and never go to the Haitian Studies Association. We would not dream of studying French history without being in dialogue with historians from France and getting their feedback on our work. But that has become a norm for a certain kind of Saint-Domingue studies done by white French historians, which disregards what's happening in Haitian studies. I myself love FHS. I have so many friends there. But I decided about 10 years ago that it was not really the place I needed to be if I wanted serious feedback on my work on Haitian history. So having said that, adding to the project of saying some of the necessary things this year at the conference, I'm delighted to add to the work of making our society less insular and thus better, um, and to be able to feature some of the most exciting work being done on 18th and 19th century Haiti by scholars who do not normally come to our conference. And we'll be shifting from the paradigm of seeing Haiti mainly as French colonial Saint-Domingue without always following its history after independence or without connecting Spanish or African histories to the story of 18th century Haiti. And I'll note, I'm using the term Haiti for the colonial period, even though independence wasn't declared till 1814, following Rob Tabor's pushing us, um, along with Haitians themselves who use it, to remember that the period when Haiti was called Saint-Domingue by the French was relatively brief, and that we should use Haitians' own name for their country. So our panel is thus eager to spark new research by encouraging others to think about Haiti in new ways. And I'm thrilled to be able to present to you a dream team of four panelists who are creating some of the most exciting new work in the field. And, and I'll be a bonus panelist for, uh, participating in the Q&A. So first up, I'm gonna tell you who they all are first, and then I will um, have them go in order. So first up will be Dr. Crystal Eddins, who is an assistant professor of Africana Studies at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Dr. Eddins holds a dual PhD in sociology and in African American and African Studies from Michigan State University. Dr. Eddins' first book, Rituals, Runaways, and the Haitian Revolution, Collective Action in the African Diaspora, came out last year from Cambridge University Press and is already garnering great acclaim for its innovative perspective. 
Dr. Eden studies not only French Saint-Domingue and the revolution, but also continuities with the Spanish colonial period and continuing interactions between French Saint-Domingue and Spanish Santo Domingo. You may know her celebrated Age of Revolutions piece on Taino resistance in the Spanish period in Haiti called the first Aesian Revolution. And if you don't know the piece, look it up after the session. Next up, we'll have Dr. Rob Tabor. Dr. Tabor earned his PhD at the University of Florida, where he studied with David Geges and focused on Haiti in the context of Latin American history. Um, Dr. Tabor Rob is now assistant professor of history at Fayetteville State University, which is an HBCU, and where he teaches about Haiti in the context of African American and world history. Uh, he co-edited the 2018 volume, Free Communities of Color and the Revolutionary Caribbean, and he is currently completing a book called The Haitian Revolution and the Making of the Modern World. Next, we will move to post-independence Haiti with Dr. Natalie Pierre, who is in her first year as assistant professor of history at Howard University. Dr. Pierre earned her PhD in African diaspora history and that of the Caribbean and Latin America, at NYU, and she is currently writing her first book, uh, tentatively called The Vessel of Independence Must Save Itself, Haitian State Formation, 1757 to 1815, which focuses on the political thought of Haitian statesmen. Um, her list of fellowships is too long to enumerate. I'll add that she is the veteran Haitian Studies Association board member even from her days as a grad student and i'm thrilled to have enticed her to come um, share her expertise at uh, our society for the first time and last but not least we will have dr marlena doe um, currently professor of french and african diaspora studies at the university of virginia professor doe is at the point in her career where she really no longer needs an introduction but just in case you aren't all familiar with her work she was trained in literature, both English and French, at the University of Notre Dame, and she's the author of numerous books on the Haitian Revolution. These include Tropics of Haiti, Race and the Literary History of the Haitian Revolution in the Atlantic World, Baron de Vate and the Origins of Black Atlantic Humanism, a forthcoming book entitled Awakening the Ashes, an Intellectual History of Haiti, with UNC Press. Those are just her books by herself. I have to mention, although uh, this is heavy new anthology that just came out a few months ago, co-edited with Gregory Piavo and Matthew Ann Roar Leitner called Haitian Revolutionary Fictions, an anthology. It's a thousand pages. Um, and Dr. Doe is also known for her public facing work, like her um, celebrated slash infamous um, New York Times essay on why Napoleon should not be celebrated today. Um, as for me, I followed the more traditional path in FHS of arriving in Haitian history from French history. Um, I started working on Haiti in the mid 1990s while writing a dissertation on the Abbe Gregoire and so was among those on the cusp of the colonial turn. Um, but I've been lucky to be more in dialogue with my colleagues in Haitian studies um, since then, so in 2012, I published Haitian History, New Perspectives, and then my brand new book, Slave Revolt on Screen, The Haitian Revolution in Film and Video Games, just came out this year. You have some flyers. So each of our four panelists will tell us a bit about themselves. What kind of work do they do on Haitian history? What does Haiti beyond Saint-Domingue mean to them? What questions do they think French historians should be asking in studying Haiti? And then I have some particular questions for each of them. So first for Dr. Eddins, I also want her to discuss how her new book thinks, helps us think about Haiti beyond Saint-Domingue. And I now turn to Professor Eddins. Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Um, and thank you so much, Alyssa, for um, putting this panel together. I'm excited to you know, share a little bit more about uh, the work that I've been doing and you know, how it interfaces um, with Haitian studies and with uh, French colonial studies. Um, so like Alyssa mentioned, um, I'm not formally trained as a historian, just to be uh, transparent. Um, my background is in uh, black studies, African and African diaspora studies, and in sociology. Um, but I think that being a, you know, a, what I call a black studies historical sociologist is part of um, what helps me to be able to bring together 
together um, ideas and frameworks and concepts from different fields that allow me to um, look at and understand the perspectives of, of enslaved people in colonial Haiti um, from their from their perspective. Uh, so my research generally deals uh, with questions surrounding um, people of African descent and how they uh, developed collective consciousness, uh, shared identity, um, cultural and religious practices um, that helped to facilitate their uh, mobilizations and collective actions and revolutions that counter uh, r racial capitalism. So my book that was just published, uh, Rituals, Runaways, and the Haitian Revolution, argued that enslaved people, Maroons, and a small number of free people of color uh, created social networks within their ritual spaces and through the act of maronage or, th or through escapes um, to help build a sense of racial solidarity that helped the Haitian Revolution's success. So in the eight chapters of the book, um, I trace the development of Haiti's um, culture of subversion by examining the transatlantic slave trade and conditions of enslavement, um, maroons and enslaved people's social networks and patterns of resistance over time that helped lead to the 1791 um, insurrection. So like I said, some of this um, work that I do primarily draws on um, black studies scholars as well as Haitian studies scholars. Um, so people like uh, Sylvia Winter, uh, Jean Fouchard, uh, Carolyn Fick, Cedric Robinson, CLR James, Michael Gomez, uh, Rochelle Beauvoir Dominique, and Jean Casimir. I um, kind of guide my reading of primary sources um, in subversive ways. So looking beyond the um, implicit and oftentimes explicit race, racial bias and language um, to bring forth enslaved people's perspectives um, and try to begin to understand uh, the ways that they may have understood their conditions, um, their lived experiences and their modes of interaction um, and their methods of resistance. So really I'm using and looking at their actions um, as a way to begin to understand their perspective you know, in, in the in lacking you know, primary sources that were written by and composed by the masses of enslaved people themselves. And so part of um, how I do this is just to start with the African continent um, and looking at the areas of the um, the areas of the continent that were most affected by the slave trade to colonial Haiti, um, primarily places like the Bight of Benin, Senegambia, and uh, West Central Africa, and looking at the ways that, looking at those spaces as the primary sites of racial capitalism and how um, people were you know, commodified and um, exploited for their labor in these spaces. Um, but also thinking about the, the coast, uh, these various coastlines as uh, the beginnings of collective consciousness and the beginnings of these shared experiences around capture, the middle passage, um, and, and resistance to the slave trade. And so I look at uh, rel religious consolidation, marinage, and uh, slave ship revolts as kind of uh, setting the pretext for the kinds of uh, resistance tactics that would later appear um, in the colony in the years uh, leading up to the Haitian Revolution. Um, so I would argue that in um, religious spaces like uh, the Kalenda, sacred martial art practices, um, practices around voodoo and poisonings, um, and in maroon communities, um, people were able to um, call on different uh, spirit guides um, to develop uh, ritual technologies around poisoning um, and other types of uh, protective self-armaments. And I look at these, again, as uh, like a socio socio-cultural or socio-religious critique of, um, of this, this, the system of slavery itself and the ways that it um, was incongruent with the types of slaveries that did exist um, on the continent of Africa but were not uh, racialized and were not based on the type of, kind of violent um, and deadly uh, labor that we see taking place in, in the Americas and in Haiti in particular. Uh, so I, I think about religion as a way, religion and Maranaj as a way of, um, as Sylvia Winter says, how enslaved people rehumanized themselves. And um, 
and I try to do this by focusing on, again, the, the many people whose, in, in some cases, names we know, but in many cases whose names we don't know. Um, instead of looking at individual heroes of the Haitian Revolution, um, I try to, again, bring attention to the, the masses. And I, and I do this through um, analysis of the runaway slave advertisements, um, most of which were published in the colonial newspaper, Les Affiches Americaines, and other papers like the Gazette de Saint-Domingue. Um, and so following black studies scholarship, um, but also some uh, social movements scholarship, uh, people like Alden Morris and uh, Charles Tilly, um, I tried to look at these advertisements and highlight um, enslaved peoples and, and Maroons' tactics of resistance, uh, the social networks that they, that they had or created, or the ways in which these advertisements at least were speculating about these, these types of uh, connections. So, for example, um, runaways who may have had a, a free member, a, a free person of color who was a family member of theirs that could have been giving them um, a safe harbor, a safe haven. Um, in some cases, Maroons were actually seeking out other um, established Maroon communities. And in other cases, um, they were using their language skills to you know, forge free passes and to blend into the population of free people of color. Um, so I look at these different types of, uh, of tactics that uh, people were using as a way to begin to understand these uh, resistance actions as well as the kind of broader structures of resistance that helped to uh, shape the Haitian Revolution's uprising. Um, so I feel like I've already um, talked a, a lot, but in terms of some of the questions around what uh, what Saint Domingue or what Haiti beyond Saint Domingue means to me is um, not only centering Haiti beyond its colonial relationship to France, um, but also recovering some of these. Um, the cultures and contributions of the, the Taino peoples, um, especially in their, their naming of Haiti. Um, and so in my work, I try to recover um, and center the 15th and 16th century um, African and indigenous traditions of rebellion in Haiti as pretext for the Haitian Revolution. Um, and just to, I guess, go back to the, the question that, um, that Alyssa wanted to bring up around, you know, what, how my book tries to bring out this, um, this period and uh, why it's so important. Um, I think centering uh, the, the history of Haiti going back to the 15th and 16th centuries um, helps us think about Haiti's centrality to the modern world, um, being the first place of European colonial conquest, um, the first place of African enslavement, on the first site of Taino genocide, um, and also the first site of, of, um, of African rebellion. So we have the first Africans being brought into the island in 1493, and by 1503, they're escaping with, um, with the Taino and quote unquote, taking up bad customs. And by 1521, it's the first revolt of, uh, of Wolof Africans. And so I think that looking at this, um, looking at this period is, is particularly important. Um, uh, because the resistance, okay, thanks. <laughs> the uh, the rebellions that were taking place in this early 16th century um, helped to or contributed to the dismantling of the um, Spanish sugar industry in um, in western or in eastern Haiti, leading up to the the late 16th and early 17th century. And so, by the time the uh, the French arrive, there's already been, if you will, a an ice and revolution. There's already been this um, long-term tradition of uh, Maroon Rebellion uh, that has dismantled or, or contributed to the dismantling of this colonial project. So I think looking at these kinds of long-term perspectives on the Haitian Revolution help us see the ways that um, they, that revolutions in general are, are not only kind of transnational um, activities, you know, coming off of the heels of the French Revolution, but that there are, you know, mechanisms of, uh, of rebellion and resistance that are um, indigenous to social spaces. And so I thought it was really cool to see that come into relief where there's this maybe pattern of revolution and counter-revolution happening 
as um, these various you know sugar industries are being implemented in the um, in the island space and we see African resistance um, pushing back against that and and doing so successfully um, so just to, to close out um, some of the things that I would you know push people to kind of think about um, in addition to these kinds of methodological questions but also to some of the the ideas that Alyssa brought up in the in the beginning in terms of uh, what it what what it means or what it should look like to do this kind of work um, for me has been um, not only again to rely on uh, black studies but also Haitian study scholars um, I do think that there has been kind of an insidious way in which um, some French and English speaking scholars have um, tended to, dis to diminish the contributions of Haitian intellectuals um, people like Jean Fouchard and Rochelle Beauvoir Dominique, who have long argued that uh, marinage and black resistance were um, were grounded within Haiti's history going back to the 15th century. So um, I'm not sure that anything that I've you know said so far has been a total surprise to you if you're more you know familiar with some of those with some of those works. Um, but I do think that it's important to um, kind of reckon with and, and grapple with those kinds of intellectual traditions of the communities that we're studying. Thank you very much, Dr. Adams Crystal. That was fantastic. And it was exactly 12 minutes, so it was perfect. Um, and I, those of you in the audience, I hope that you're feeling right now that you came to the right session. And that <laughs> learning a lot here. So next up is going, uh, is going to be Rob Tabor. Uh, and I'm going to ask him a question, which um, Crystal touched on too. How does he try, even using French sources, to get out from enslavers point of view and also how does his work in african-american and atlantic history help bring new lenses to studying the french colonial period of saint domain thank you uh, it's great to be here with everyone today and thanks to professor Seppenwell for organizing and chairing the session uh, this time that we have together uh, in 1626, when Cardinal Richelieu gave the commission to Monsieur uh, Denambouc and de Rossi to create French colonies on hospital islands unpossessed by any king or prince at the so-called Gates of Peru, there were already Maroons, Buccaneers, and other individuals outside of state control living off the land in what we now know as Haiti and knew then as Haiti. One of the first recognized French towns in the area, complete with parish priest and plantation-grown sugar, was Leogan, built on or near the site of Spanish town La Iguana, which was built on or near the site of the capital of the Taino polity, Yaragua. Contemporary Leogan is a thriving outpost of Port-au-Prince and the heart of earthquake responses. The local Catholic parish is still, to this day, dedicated to St. Rose of Lima, the first person born in the Americas to be canonized by the Catholic Church. Uh, at heart, personally, I am a social historian with an eye on political and cultural questions shaped by economic and military factors. I went from an undergrad steeped in early modern European history to a senior thesis uh, written in an early Americanist framework to a graduate program where Haiti is part of Latin America, where Haitian is either Haitian Creole is either the third or fifth most common natal language in Latin America, depending on how you consider Aymara and uh, Guarani, and where I fulfilled my doctoral language requirements with Creole and French as two distinct languages of scholarship. I open with this précis of the history of Leogan because when I consider the prompt of Haiti beyond Saint-Domingue, I look in three different directions. First, I look across time, as Professor Edens has mentioned. Uh, the period when the area had a formal government that called itself Saint-Domingue was comparatively short. The name itself continued to echo in French propaganda, in U.S. enslavers' terrors, in Pierre Vassier and Charles Frosten's commentaries on colonialism and imperialism, and any time one is in a Francophonie airport with connections to Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic, which causes a weird like time shift when you're catching a flight in Martinique and you're like, I can take a flight back centuries, what's going on here? <laughs> but the colonial polity San Domingue was itself comparatively short-lived and steeped in the political and economic context of the 18th century. Next, I look across space. Much has been said about the reverberations and transatlantic uh, impacts and connections of the Haitian Revolution. Otto Ferrer and Anne Eller have done important work also on what the image of Saint-Domingue as sugar colony exemplaire uh, has 
you know, how it influenced politics in Cuba and the Dominican Republic, respectively. A less explored approach is to look at abolition, emancipation, post-slavery, state, and national reconstruction in a hemispheric context. Haiti was the first sovereign state to engage in the 19th century sweep of reconstruction and the national reimagining it prompted. The issue of transitioning from Creole governance to multiracial democracy is a hemispheric struggle. I would contend that it is not a coincidence that the Americas have uniformly the strongest birthright citizenship protections uh, in the world enshrined in the United States by the post-Civil War 14th Amendment, which, uh, you know, thanks to Martha Jones's work in Birthright Citizens and other scholars we know comes out of the Black Convention movement in the 19th century. And North Carolina, where we are all gathered to get today, was required to ratify the 14th Amendment uh, before it could rejoin the United States um, after the Confederate Rebellion in defense of slavery. And these are rights and legal understandings that do not stem from the French Revolution. This framework of contested transition from Creole governance uh, to multiracial democracy not, on, not only underscores some of Michel Rolf Trio, Mimi Scheller, and Matthew Smith's work on Haitian politics, Enrique Lasso's work on Colombia, Erica Edwards on Argentina, and Cristina Soriano's on Venezuela, and many, many works on Brazil and Mexico and other Latin American nations where Afro-Latin American studies is becoming a larger and larger field, encouragingly. Um, but it reminds our Latin Americanist colleagues that the role of African descended peoples in the state and nation is still a hemispheric conversation of contemporary importance. Finally, I look across depth. While I love much about the Atlantic turn, for a number of years it felt like some France-oriented researchers would touch on quote-unquote Saint-Domingue for a soupçon exotique, while others kept their analysis limited to the white colonial population or white colonial institutions. The challenge in the historiography of colonial Haiti remains filling out basic aspects of the core and remembering that even when we're analyzing free populations of color, les gens de couleur libre only made up 5 to 10 percent of the total population once we get past 1720 or so, then most people who lived in Saint-Domingue carried enslaved status throughout their life in that colony, only changing their circumstances through flight or revolution. As I read some work by historians of France on Saint-Domingue, on colonial Haiti, I look at the shelf by my office computer where there are about 16 or 18 volumes related primarily to colonial Haiti and another 10 that I consider essential reading on the French Atlantic. On the next shelf over are two rows on Atlantic topics, a row on the Haitian Revolution itself, and a row on post-independence Haiti. The next shelf over has two rows of books on the form and functioning of the Black Atlantic and, but not limited to, the transatlantic slave trade. I say this not to highlight my hoarding habits or to, you know, engage in comparison, but to remind those historians of France interested in colonial topics, especially as second, third, or fourth books after monographs on the hexagon, is that a brief dive into Moreau de Saint-Marie after a visit to Aix or to the Bibliothèque Nationale does not due diligence make. Engagement with this historiography, including and especially Haitian authors, uh, as Professor Edens highlighted, is an element of basic respect to the people whose lives you are studying and discussing. This standard is not cancel culture. It is doing the homework and catching up on the conversation. One of the challenges in all of this work is that we have significantly uh, fewer surviving records, less documentation about the lives of enslaved individuals, families, and communities than we do of European colonists or even of free residents of color. In most parishes, the priest kept a separate record for the enslaved and it didn't make it to the French archives. Plantation inventories and other notarized documents touching on enslaved life are scant before 1777. The lowest levels of the judiciary would purge files to make space with many decisions not even surviving long enough to make it into Moreau de Saint-Marie's Loisy Constitution. The ads describing fugitives and the lists of jailed captives, both published in Les Affiches Americaines and the Gazette de Saint-Domingue, don't start being printed until those newspapers themselves start production in the 1760s. The late great historian of colonial Mexico, James Lockhart, wrote about the, quote, law of the conservation of energy of historians, end quote, meaning that the sources that are the easiest to read and access will be read first and most. The archives of the Haitian Revolution itself, the most successful political movement ever undertaken by and for enslaved people, are scattered, divided largely between France, Spain, Britain, and the United States. So we have to exert energy to find sources related to the experiences of the enslaved and read them carefully and in context text, as they are almost invariably produced by the enslavers or slave owners. Here, the works of our colleagues in literary criticism and black studies take on tremendous importance because the insights from Doris Gowray, 
Marlena Doe, and others help us recognize the tropes that permeate colonial writings, especially documents by French men about black women and men. I also appreciate the work by Dr. Gabrielle Foreman and her team in creating the community-sourced writing teaching about slavery document, which you can find after a quick Google search. It exists as a, a Google Doc. A key principle in all of this work is to remember that you're writing about people in all of their complexity and to respect their humanity and the fact that slavery was a legal status, not who they were. When Cardinal Richelieu granted that 1626 commission to Monsieur de Nambouc and de Rossi to take charge of Saint Christophe and Barbuda, he recognized that he was catching up to events that had already transpired in the Americas. Moreau de Saint-Marie later saw that commission as a key early document worthy of inclusion in his massive Loisy Constitution Compendium, which Moreau de Saint-Marie described as, quote, a manual to serve whoever will have something to do with that brilliant colony of Saint-Domingue. As we look within and beyond this manual, realize that Haiti's colonial period was brilliant for few, not named Moreau de Saint-Marie, and that its time as Saint-Domingue was brief indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. <clears throat> I feel obliged to maybe add, after these two brilliant papers, that if people are not aware of this, it may be implicit in what we're saying, there are French historians who, even in the last few years, um, in books related to Haiti, have said that the majority of the population was illiterate and therefore could not be studied. So this is one reason that our panel is talking about the ways in which existing sources can be used. Um, so I thank both of them very much for these wonderful papers. Okay, next up we're going to go to Dr. Natalie Pierre as we move to post independence Haiti, although her work starts earlier. Um, and I've asked her to think about how does an African diaspora perspective help us understand Haitian history um, instead of thinking just in terms of colonial France and then the post-colonial early 19th century. And also, how does she think about Haitian state formation, which again is a term that she's using also for the 18th century, um, and it's starting even before independence was declared. So Dr. Pierre. Good afternoon. I thank the organizers of the Society for French Historical Studies for asking participants to consider identity, inclusion, and exclusion in the Francophone, Francophone world. In my remarks, I offer a conceptual shift that allows me to render visible structures of analytic exclusion which enable racism. I am especially grateful to Dr. Alyssa Sepinwall for including me on this presidential panel alongside colleagues at the forefront of Haitian studies. To begin, I, ask you to, I invite you to consider the following puzzle with me. By the start of the U.S. Civil War, post-colonial Haiti was the third most important coffee exporter behind Brazil and the Dutch East Indies. Today, Haiti imports the majority of Canadian herring and 80% of commercially distributed vetiver oil comes from Okai in Haiti. Vetiver is an essential oil used in most French perfumes. One website even claims that, quote, Haiti is to vetiver what Ibiza is to partying. Though I haven't partied in Ibiza, <laughs> I know the quality of French perfume, the ubiquitousness of herring in Haitian cuisine, and the importance of coffee during the first industrial revolution. And yet, the economic importance of Haitian producers and consumers in this equation escapes our analytic intention. This silence enables racism. From the 19th century to the present, the invisibility of Haitian commercial behavior and impact on global market persists because scholars ignored the lucrative aspects of illegal trade. Furthermore, contemporary tropes of failed statehood render vetiver producers and herring consumers invisible because of a, of a mistaken correlation between stable governance and economic impact. How is it possible that the only nation with a last name, poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere, according to Haitian poet Jean-Claude Martineau, animates the entire fishing industry in New Brunswick, Canada, produces large volumes of vetiver in the 21st century, and was a dominant coffee producer throughout the 19th century. 
This is the puzzle I offer up to members of the Society for French Historical Studies. With your unfettered access to provincial and bureaucratic archives, perhaps even correspondence between families separated due to Haitian independence, I think an outline of an answer to, th to this puzzle will emerge. During the Q&A, I am happy to provide examples of how my analytic method can be used on French subjects from the long 19th century. For now, here is how I resolve some of these puzzles present in my scholarship. In short, a clear and precise epistemology of the African diaspora is the solution. As a working poor immigrant to these United States, my family made the significance of the Haitian Revolution known early and often. It functioned as a protective bomb in the 1990s context of the CDC's declaration that the HIV AIDS epidemic was due to the four H's, hemophiliacs, heroin users, homosexuals, and Haitians. I distinctly recall undereducated teachers fearful of touching Haitian children and quarantining us in ESL courses, even if the students were avid English language book readers like myself. I'm not sure if I was more indignant at being placed in lower level reading courses or seeing adults grant tacit permission to children to label us HBO, a clever acronym for Haitian body odor. Nonetheless, this was at odds with the narrative articulated by my parents and thus brewed a question. Yes, my ancestors were revolutionary war heroes. Then what? Because certainly living at the margins of an already ostracized US African American population couldn't be connected to that heroic past. The manner in which I just oriented myself in relation to my research is not an argument about how the personal is, is political. In fact, I just practiced the discursive strategy recommended by Kim Butler in her path-breaking article, Defining Diaspora, Refining a Discourse, which establishes a clear epistemology of the African diaspora. She presents six characteristics to identify this conceptual framework. A violent, a violent dispersal to two or more locations, alienation slash discrimination in the host land, a collective imagined connection to the homeland, idealization of return to the homeland, multiple generations settled in the host land, and an ongoing relationship to the homeland. In my case, my scholarship and community building efforts in Brooklyn, New York, are the sustained mechanisms by which I maintain social and political ties to Haiti. My first book tentatively titled The Vessel of Independence Must Save Itself, Haitian State Formation from Macandal to the 1815 Congress of Vienna addresses the slow transition into nationhood. The book makes three principal arguments. First, Haitian independence created the most diverse American government of the 19th century. Second, Haitian independence expanded free trade in the Americas. And finally, Haitian experimentation with different modes of government were not aberrations, but in exact alignment with the range of options considered, excuse me, considered by their post-colonial American counterparts. I interrogate these modes of governance and trace the cultivation of nationalism among the people who became the first generation of Haitians. Over 60% of Haitians were born in Africa, free, in the last quarter of the 18th century. Those who were American-born were either propertied without the protection of French civil rights or enslaved workers with limited pathways toward emancipation. Whether African or American-born, the people who became Haitian were swept up either in the restructuring of European empires, commonly known as an age of revolution, or in wars of imperial consol consolidation where West African states sought to protect their subjects from the transatlantic traffic of Africans by subjecting others to chattel slavery for commercial profit. In my view, it is critical to highlight these sending contexts before chronicling how Haitians experimented with various forms of government they thought best suited those who climbed aboard what Henri Christophe called, quote, the vessel of independence. To investigate Haiti beyond Saint-Domingue, I employ epistemologies of the African diaspora, 
I couple classic, classic historical methods, explorations of the British archive, and reviews of hefty tomes of Haitian legislation with the contributions made by anthropologists, linguists, literary scholars, and archaeologists. Their research generates a textured landscape of understanding that is routinely denied to the African who mainly pops up as a number on a ledger in the imperial archive. The African diasporic framework allows me to bypass the limited time frame of the Black Atlantic, which forces us to center the colonial enterprise begun by Spain and perfected by France in what became Haiti. Practically speaking then, this epistemological orientation allows me to question popular narratives in Haitian history. From an African diasporic perspective, Jean-Jacques Dessalines' decision to govern as an emperor challenges the cliff note statement that Haiti was, quote, the only successful slave revolt and became the first black republic. Through the proposed conceptual approach, we immediately learn that the first self-proclaimed black republic was that of the Palmares in 17th century Brazil. By claiming that the Haitian Republic emerged synchronously to independence excludes not only the Palmares, but also the 13 months of Dessalines' government. This approach also reveals that the largest black slave revolt was in Iraq during the 9th century, where up to 1.5 to 2.5 million enslaved Zanj rose up against the Abbasid Caliphate. By including the global African diaspora from pre-modern times and shifting to non-French sites of Atlantic slavery, a clearer image of Africans struggling against plantation, against plantation slavery emerges, while also taking into account the full range of governing structures they may have had in mind. To go beyond the Genovese argument of whether, Haitian, of whether the Haitian Revolution was mere imitation or restoration allows scholars like Nick Nesbitt to speculate about the evolution of the 1222 Monday Charter in the political consciousness of inheritors of the Monday Empire. Nesbitt writes, quote, centuries before such civil rights would even be theorized in the West. The Monday Charter founded a society based upon the universal and unqualified rights of all human beings to be free from enslavement. To include a wide range of African-based systems of government and, govern and African notions of rights creates an expanded outlook beyond the experimental ideals of the, in, uh, ideals of the European Enlightenment. In Butler's previously mentioned essay, she advances the concept of simultaneous diasporan identities. She writes, quote, take for an example, a descendant of the Arabian peoples who moved to Egypt in the seventh century CE, who now lives in London. It could well be argued that this individual could be considered part of the African diaspora based on place of birth, yet he or she is simultaneously part of a new or young post-colonial African diaspora, a middle-aged modern African diaspora, and an old Arabian diaspora. These terms are used intentionally to evoke a reference to the life history of diasporas. Okay, forgive me, I had planned for 15 minutes, so I'm just going to skip. Okay, French historians can adopt the epistemologies of the African diaspora, not only to trace refugee French planters who successfully resisted the liquidation of their assets held in humans, but also to ask what were the cultural slash regional origins of the Frenchmen deported back to France. The category of Petit Blanc in Saint-Domingue is imprecise and mainly attracts analytic attention when we consider marriage between property-owning women of color and poor whites. There ought to be more examination about the non-elite actors who were functionaries in colonial Haiti. What is the life history of this working poor white francophone diaspora? In effect, I'm asking members of the Society for French Historical Studies to provincialize Europe via France to borrow the words of Depeche Chakrabarti. In the Anglophonic African diaspora, for example, scholars trace Caribbean dialects to specific regions of Ireland and England. Further, in the case of these United States, we understand the majority of white settlers did not own enslaved property. 
Here, the careful study of class relations allows us to consider how working poor British invested in whiteness to strengthen the structures of slavery. So I'm, I will stop here and look forward to sharing more during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pierre. Um, if this was the first time that you heard Natalie Pierre speak, perhaps you have an idea of why I love going to the Haitian Studies Association and getting to learn from brilliant younger and older colleagues um, like Dr. Pierre, who have very different training than I did as a French historian. So we're going to come now finally to Professor Doe, Marlena, um, and the questions that I asked her in particular were also, what are some things that you think historians trained in French history often get wrong about Haiti? And why should we be paying more attention to the early 19th century than we have? What should early 19th century French historians know about the kingdom of Henri Christophe? Um, well, thank you all. Thank you to my co-panelists as well for those brilliant, um, for those brilliant presentations, and of course to Alyssa and all the organizers of the conference and everyone in the room there. Um, I appreciate that you are there, even though we are not, and uh, at least uh, Alyssa and I are not, and are over here. Um, so, the Alyssa mentioned a little bit that um, my background is in literary history, and uh, my first book was a literary history of the Haitian Revolution. Um, that actually spans from time periods before the revolution to afterward um, in terms of, well, what are the arguments and representations and theories of mind um, and habits of discourse that actually shaped how people wrote about the events as they were happening and uh, framed them in their long wake. Um, and so the book um, takes us through the 1860s through the end of the U.S. Civil War. Um, but one of the things that I consistently noticed as I was working on that book and the book about Bellin de Vate, who was one of the most prominent writers in the Kingdom of Haiti, led by Henri Christophe, a former general of the Haitian uh, Revolutionary Army. Um, one of the things I noticed was that there was a lot of PV mentions um, in the historical discourse that in the book I juxtaposed with the fictional discourse because they influenced each other enormously in the 19th century. Um, you would find Victor Hugo's novels being cited by by uh, historians like James Redpath or John Beard as sources. Um, and so this fascinated me, the interplay between history and fiction. What fascinated me even more though, especially as I got into working on the Baron de Vate book, because I looked a lot also at um, 20th century fictional representations of the Kingdom of Haiti, of which there were a lot. Um, you might, As you might imagine, during the period of the Harlem Renaissance, black authors were fascinated by the idea that there was this black king in the Caribbean and really confused, fascinated. They were in consternation over it. And that lasted for a while. Derek Walcott, Aimé Césaire, um, Edward Glissant to a certain extent, really wanting to kind of delve into this. But what fascinated me even more was when I stepped back out to the historical side to find that even contemporary historians, most of them contemporary historians of French studies, French colonialism, refer to things that happened in the fictional works about Christophe as if they were truths. One of the biggest of that is that the myth um, promulgated first by 19th century authors after the king's suicide in 1820, that he had quote unquote re-enslaved the Haitian people. I found it fascinating that people who are trained historians would repeat something without digging deep into it to see where's the evidence. Um, nobody, there's not a single person in the time period who ever offered any evidence that enslavement was happening under Henri Christophe. Um, affirmage certainly was happening as it happened under Santonax, Paul Verrel and Julien Raymond in the 18th century, uh, in 18th century Saint-Domingue under the French Republic, as it happened under Jean-Jacques Dessalines as well. Um, but affirmage is a system of leasing or sharecropping. It kind of resembles feudalism, which is not great, but I think we can all agree feudalism is not chattel slavery. Um, and so it fascinated me that some of the dynamics that I had studied as a historical phenomenon that of course we wouldn't be doing that anymore, we are serious, um, were 
were, were still in existence. Um, and so I'm going to combat this, hopefully, uh, this push to oblivion, because that's what I call it. The idea of, first of all, that we've studied the Haitian Revolution too much, that I hear a lot now. Everybody wants to talk about the Haitian Revolution and not 19th century Haiti. And I always say we have to do both. We have to be able to hold all of these things in our mind uh, at the same time and their interplay. Um, so I'm going to begin in a kind of narrative mode and then and then end um, with a, a few more remarks. I'm going to begin with um, a quote from Alejo Carpentier's The Kingdom of This World, because his novel has had an enormous influence on histories written about the King of Haiti and the Kingdom of Haiti. Um, and I'm uh, actually astonished sometimes when I tell colleagues well, who will remain nameless that I'm writing a book on Henri Christophe and they say, oh, I teach about him. I teach Alejo Carpentier's novel which is a beautiful novel. It is not history, as Arlette Farge reminds us in The Allure of the Archive, lives are not novels. And for those of us who have chosen to write history, the stakes are not fictional. So the, an opening uh, quotation. But what surprised T. Noel most was the discovery that this marvelous world, the like of which the governors of Cat had never known, was a world of Negroes. I'm going to begin at the end. The queen was praying over the inert body of her husband, Henri Christophe, who had become king of Haiti in March 1811. Her teenage children, Prince Victor Henri and Princesses Anne, Athanaïr, and Françoise Emétiste, knelt by her side, softly weeping. Only moments earlier, the king's men had told Queen Marie-Louise what she already feared. Christophe, betrayed by his own military and nearly all his closest confidants, had shot himself in the heart. Night had fallen and the palace was alarmingly quiet. The king's deathbed was cloaked in the kind of incongruous, placid calm that rarely accompanies the sudden discovery of a suicide. Christophe's blood had stained the white sheets. His eyes were fixed open in a wide, stab stare. The serenity of the scene was only interrupted when the king's doctor and several of his oldest advisors entered the bedroom. The palace's gates would at any moment be breached. The royal family needed to hide Christophe's body if they hoped to save it from the terrible fate that had befallen the Emperor Dessalines, whose corpse was torn to pieces when it was dragged through the streets of port au prince after he was assassinated nearly 14 years earlier to the day. The king's personal guards, the royal Daume, were summoned to assist the queen and her children. They attempted to carry the body up to Christophe's famous fortress, the Citadel Henri, located atop Pic La Ferrière in northern Haiti. The long gravel road to the fortress, around five miles from Sans Souci Palace, winds up the mountain at a barely passable, dangerous 35 degree angle. Once the defunct king's cortege reached the top of the citadel, Christophe's guards helped Marie Louise and her children dig a shallow grave in an interior courtyard where they buried the king's remains before pouring lime over him. Barely a dozen people attended the makeshift internment that marked the unceremonious end of the self-proclaimed first monarch crowned in the new world. Tempted to blame the legendary tyranny that led the St. Lucian poet and playwright Derek Walcott to refer to the Haitian king as a squalid fascist who chained his own people, so many writers have searched in vain for a lesson in Christophe's death. In his novel, The Kingdom of This World, Cuban author Alejo Carpentier gave recourse to the legends of 19th century British travelers to explain how quickly all the king's men had turned against him. The bull's blood that those thick walls of the citadel had drunk was an infallible charm against the arms of the white men. But this blood had never been directed against Negroes, whose shouts coming closer now were invoking powers to which they made blood sacrifice. Just before he kills himself in Dan Hammerman's 1945 play, Henri Christophe, produced for the American Negro Theater in New York City, the overwrought Haitian monarch reflects, I don't know, maybe it's because a man has no right being a king in the first place. Yet kings and queens still exist, and history has shown that presidents are no more immune to the charge of base tyranny than monarchs. As Christophe's successor, President Jean-Pierre Bouillet would learn during the coup d'etat that unseated and then sent him into exile in 1843. President Boyer had been in power for 25 years. He governed the entire island, the Haitian historian Demisval de Lorme wrote. 
He was the most perfect personification of authority that had ever been known in this country and that we could know in this country. This president of the Republic was a king. Louis Philippe of France was more of a president than Boyer. That was what he said. The prolification historian Enoch Trouillot assigned a much simpler reason for King Henry's illegibility in global political thought. At bottom, Christophe's greatest mistake, he said, and that of his partisans, was to have disappeared too early from the scene, which is to say before the future historians of Pétion and Boyer's Republic, who were his most pitiless adversaries. In suicide, Christophe could effectively control his destiny, but he could not control his legacy. William Wilberforce, friend and frequent correspondent of the king, acknowledged as much when he remarked, poor Christophe, I cannot help grieving at the idea of his character being left to the dogs and vultures to be devoured. The King of Haiti's tragic death is one of the most dramatized episodes in Haitian history. The scene appears in not one, but three of Walcott's plays, as well as in Aimé Césaire's famous La Tragédie du Roi Christophe, and in plays by J.H. Amherst and Selden Rodman. But the tendency of historians and artists alike to portray Christophe's downfall as inevitable has obscured the intricate personal and political events that led to his dramatic demise making his death one of the least understood moments in the history of the Americas. When the royal family refer returned to the palace after having buried the king, they found their home had been invaded. Angry inhabitants from Cap and Milo were plundering the royal residence, stealing its expensive furniture, imported jewels, and looking for its hidden treasures. Soldiers shot at the ceiling of the Salle des Chefs, ruining the mural believed to have been painted by the British artist Richard Evans. Far from trying to prevent this pillage, the king's soldiers, most of whom were in open insurrection, took part in it. The next day, Marie-Louise and her daughters were arrested in Cap, along with Prince Victor and Christophe's older son from a previous relationship, Prince Eugène. The nobles who had remained loyal to the king, including Baron de Vaté and Generals Joachim and Do, were also jailed. Though Boyer had ordered the Republican army to avoid bloodshed while securing the city of Cap, the directive came too late. General Richard, the former Duke of Marmalade and the head of the conspiracy of the nobles, ordered the prisoners' deaths at around 10 p.m. on October 18th. Prince Victor pled for his life, reminding his father's former friends that, quote, his only crime was to be the son of their enemy. Richard responded by explaining that though the prince was just 16 years old, as the heir to his father's throne, quote, the tranquility of the state demanded his life, end quote. Unable to shake the memory of those terrifying moments when her sons were taken from her, Marie-Louise decided to go to England with her daughters one year after the executions. Although Marie-Louise had been by Christophe's side since the earliest days of the Haitian Revolution, and she eventually outlived her entire family, dying long after all of them in 1851, hardly any of the kingdom's many chroniclers bothered to consult her tale. Much later, while living in exile in Italy, as one of the only black faces in her words, she at last told her story to a British acquaintance who had been a frequent visitor at the palace. She lamented having suffered through the deaths of her husband and all but one of her children, including that of her eldest son, François Ferdinand, who died in Paris at the hands of the Napoleon regime in 1805. Neither seeking recognition, glory, pity, or wealth, she sighed, I have lost a husband, an empire, and nearly all my children. Sorrow has quite weaned me from the vanities of this life. At my age and in my situation, I can only look forward to the next world as a place of rest and peace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Doe. That was also wonderful. I have to say that I have learned a lot um, from Marlena uh, about my own assumptions about Christophe. Um, and looking beyond many of the things that have been said about him by, um, as she said, 19th century Haitian historians um, who were more aligned um, with uh, Pétion Boyer. Um, I was also going to say that I drew Professor um, Doe's introduction from things that she sent me, but I realized as she was talking that she had excluded one of the most important things in this regard, which is that she is the uh, author of a forthcoming biography on Henri stuff. So we can all look forward to that. All right. I think what I'm going to do next, we planned this, right? You all like sessions where there can be time for discussion rather than just people talking at you. So we planned this to have shorter talks and allow you to talk with us. So I'm now going to open it to the audience um, for questions or 
not uh, extremely, extremely long comments um, for the panelists. <laughs> I have questions I can ask otherwise if you're formulating a moment. I'll, I'll wait just a moment to see if anyone has anything to say and if not, I will start off. Okay, so I will start off for now um, and I know that you'll, you'll be thinking of things to reflect on or ask. So my question for the panelists, and it's a question that I often get from people. Um, what sources are there to do more work on women? in the Haitian Revolution. Uh, right now, when someone asks me for a book on women in the Haitian Revolution, the only thing to refer them to, there are articles, of course, is Baina Bello's illustrated picture book on sheroes of the Haitian Revolution. And we know there are sources that we just haven't looked for. Um, as Marlena just mentioned, there are a surprising number of things on Marie Louise, who our colleague in England, Nicole Wilson, has been telling us things that we did not know existed. So yes, women um, and sources in the Haitian Revolution, if anyone has thoughts they would like to share. Go first. I'll, I'll start um, because that was actually the question that I was asking when I was first starting out in graduate school. That was the first topic that I wanted to explore was, you know, the different roles that, um, that women um, undertook during the revolution. And, you know, everybody told me that, you know, it wasn't possible and that the sources weren't there and that, you know, because of the ways that, you know, the uh, French grammar kind of conceals um, the, the, the way that the pronouns when there are mixed genders um, kind of goes to or defaults to the to the masculine in some ways kind of conceals these um, conceals women's presence right um, so we do know that there are you know a, a certain number of women who do appear in the record women like uh, Marie Jean Le, Le Martinier uh, women like Sanité Belair um, but out and Cecile Fatiman um, but besides some of these kind of notable women that come up in some of these uh, primary source narratives, um, I instead turn to looking at the runaway advertisements um, where approximately 14 to 15 percent of the um, of the maroons were were women, um, which obviously is not necessarily you know in parity with the um, with the men who escaped plantations, and you know there are reasons for that in terms of the level of you know scrutiny that that women were under um, regarding their kind of over over representation as uh, field hands on these plantations, right? But um, but I have found the advertisements to, to be useful in terms of thinking about, um, thinking beyond some of the limitations um, that previous you know, generations of, of scholarship have uh, asserted are, are present. Um, so just to give a quick example, um, one of the advertisements that I found was for a woman named uh, Charlotte from the uh, Papillon Plantation. Um, she's described as a Poulard woman who escapes uh, the Cap, uh, the Cap Francais region in August or in the spring of 1790. Um, and it was suspected that she was um, hiding around Port-au-Prince for several months. And this woman is, was actually, you know, later described in other sources as the romantic partner of Jean-Francois Papillon, who was one of the early leaders of the Haitian Revolution, um, who then later becomes uh, a general within the Spanish army. And so um, that was one example of how um, not only women were perhaps participating in terms of helping to um, maybe coordinate events, um, but also kind of harkens to some of the ways that um, that scholars have talked about uh, women using maronage and developing these kinds of social networks across space that help to you know, create the broader fabric of resistance. Um, so that's just one example of, of how I've been able to, to find sources. Um, I know you've, yeah. you, we've had conversations about this. We have had conversations <laughs> about this. I mean, and one of the things that I find is that as we are centering the experiences of Haitian women, uh, the chronology shifts, where it stops being such a strict 1791 to 1804, this is the story of the Haitian Revolution. And in fact, when you go and examine some of the sort of the classic uh, books of the 20th and early 21st century, such as Black 
Black Jacobins and eventually the New World, uh, there are very few individual women who show up uh, in these otherwise excellent uh, things. Um, but yeah, so the source base, um, Crystal already mentioned the, the runaway ads uh, can be particularly fruitful. Uh, the notary and parish documents, uh, even though they tend to focus on uh, free women of color who are still there and participating. Uh, you can also sometimes find the experiences of enslaved women. Uh, this is one reason why I have uh, been so interested in free enslaved marriages, these many missions through marriage. For that article that I am going to finish writing someday, uh, journal editors have told me that articles are supposed to be about one idea and this is about 10, which has been part of the struggle. Uh, but this is how I was able to piece together the life of Marie Rose, uh, who's there with Romaine La Prophetesse, uh, but just finding the notary documents. Um, or Jean Ton, the mother of Balthazar Angenac, who's the longtime Secretary of State of Haiti, of early national Haiti, uh, and he's there in the notary documents with her, and in his memoirs, he's always with his white dad. Um, and so finding that, that dissonance um, or that, that distinction there. Um, and so, so the chronology shifts, we do, again, we have to just like use sort of more expanded sources. Um, but this is one reason why I'm so excited also about the, the work of uh, Natalie Pierre on state formation, uh, Winter Schneider also, who are looking at these connections between the, the colonial and the revolutionary and the early national, um, because that's where we see things. And one of the questions uh, that I kind of hold in my heart, not to get too personal, but we see all these, uh, you know, we see women of color as community leaders um, economically and just also, you know, as I'm looking at these marriages, they're the free spouse who then gets erased by the archive, um, where I, I have the marriages where they're the ones bringing their partners out of slavery, and then a couple years later, these couples are doing business deals, and it's always, you know, the, the, the man doesn't have honorifics, it's, you know, blah, 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 deep, blah, 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 the so-called, but then just his woman. Um, and then how do we think about the crafting of a Haitian public sphere um, in this 19th century liberal framework um, where it's a male-dominated public sphere? And this is one of those, these questions also where African diasporic studies uh, comes really into to bear um, as well as just general like womanist critiques from the 1970s and moving forward. But yeah, it's a, it's a central question of Haitian revolutionary studies moving forward. What I, what I can add is um, I'm primarily a political historian and a bulk of my primary sources are Haitian legislation. And what a, a caveat about the legislation that I examine in my work is I call them legal fictions because the governments that issued these laws never had the full time to develop uh, praxis of these laws because of successive coups, um, suicide, civil war, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that we see in legislation from Dessalines government up to Christophe's government are laws that are specifically highlighting the plight of women in Haitian society. Mm -hmm. So I developed this concept of fetal personhood in in Dessalines uh, empire where there are very clear ways for women to get what we would now call the pension of a deceased father from the Haitian Revolution. So that's one example of the ways that I'm able to pull out women from these laws. And in another way that I'm able to pull out uh, women during Dessalines government is actually a tragic tale of a French general who extends the temporal limits of the Haitian Revolution by occupying uh, the former Spanish colony on the eastern side of the island. And he issues what I'm calling an enslavement proclamation in 1805, where he is specifically targeting children. And there's a gendered aspect to how he's targeting these children. So he tells us specifically what he wants to do with women who are known to be freeborn Haitian girls and how he would like to incorporate them into a new system of slavery in what becomes the Dominican Republic. So this is a way that I'm using legislation to pull out um, women's experiences in the early, uh, in, in early post-colonial Haiti. Mm -hmm. 
Right, and Marlena, do you want to come on in on this one? Um, sure, I would just add that um, I tend to think of this question as, I mean, I see the revolutionary women in um, Haiti everywhere. I mean, I think that they are pretty well documented. I think that um, we must expand what we consider to be revolutionary as well. Um, for example, um, as Crystal mentioned, the and Rob also the the affiche américaine, the uh, the notices for Esclave Marron, Marron, they have two, two different sections, the ones for the Marrons who were caught and the ones who were at large. And they have their names there and we read about hundreds of women hundreds of women young women old women and one of the things that these ads will teach you is that for anybody who thinks oh why didn't enslaved people do more there are old men old women who run away that's how bad it is they run away there are children who run away there was an ad for a young girl who was 11 and i thought for her to think sending her life alone into the hills was safer than remaining where she was. So I view an, as acts of revolution as well, the mere fact of surviving. When I read sales of plantation records and I see Rosette, 96 years old, I say Rosette was a survivor because to survive in colonial saint domain, you know, Ilham Dobertoy was sentenced to death because he wrote about how horrible conditions were, even while displaying all the prejudices of, of the time, simply because he said, you can't live above two to three years if you've been forcibly transported here from Africa. You probably won't live above 15 or 16 years. So so again, Rosette, 96 years old, um, I, I view those kinds of actions as just as revolutionary as Toussaint Liberture, as uh, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, because this was, as Jean Casimir is constantly reminding us, a, a system of death that wasn't designed to produce life. And um, one of the greatest things he says in a, a documentary, a recent documentary, is that the transformation of colonial saint domain into independent Haiti produced a system of now the population increases. Now, and, and behind those statements, obviously, are women. I think that system of life are all the women. Um, and, and so I would just say to encourage us all to keep on going um, and, and um, that the sources are there. It's us changing our ideas sometimes about what these words mean, resistance, agency, all of those things. Thank you. What a wonderful collection of answers. I'm so glad I asked that question. Hopefully the audience has been thinking of something. I just wanted to one thing in reflecting on all of these. Um, Rob said during his talk this idea of low-hanging fruit, and I think it's really important for us to keep in mind. As British historians, we like to think of ourselves as cutting edge. We have this kind of reputation and tradition that we create ideas that are borrowed by historians in other fields. And yet, um, French historians have often been, let's say, a little bit lazy and not creative when studying colonial Saint-Domingue, and we're used to using correspondence, and when we have papers that are by white colonists, we have centered them. And again, people have said, well, you know, we don't know how to get to the ideas of enslaved people. And look at all of these creative ways in which the people on the panel are using them, whether applying, as Crystal does, social network theory to looking at, um, I, I don't want to say, right, uh, what's the word I should use? Self-liberating individuals, right, following Gabriel Foreman's idea that runaway slaves um, is, is limiting. Um, so there, there are a lot of things we can do. I hope that the things people are saying in the panel are helping prompt in your mind ways to get around these limits. All right, one, one, let me turn to the audience. I do want to get back later to Natalie Pierre, who would like to tell you about HSA. Um, comments or questions from the audience? All right, so I can't see everyone with their mask, but the hand of the person sitting next to Christy. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is Jennifer Palmer. So I have a question. Hi. I have a question for Natalie. Um, so Natalie, I'm really fascinated by your, first of all, thank you to all of you. This is a great panel. Um, I'm really fascinated by your idea of epistemologies, epistemologies of the African diaspora. And I'm wondering how you use that and how it plays out in an undergraduate classroom. Oh, thank you for that question. I'm actually working with some of the essays that I cited in this article with my students. So, um, in the early 2000s, Colin Palmer, in a forum for the AHA, he's tasked with defining the African diaspora because the concept is becoming loosely constructed because of university investments in the field. So he advances this idea, we need to impose a periodization schema on the African diaspora, and he gives us five streams. The first stream is just the origin of the human species to the point where you don't even need to categorize that as a historian. But the ones that matter in terms of uh, historical analysis are the pre-modern African diaspora and the modern African diaspora. The second stream is the movement of Bantu-speaking peoples from West Africa to Central to South. And of course, we're also including ancient Egypt, ancient Nubia, their, um, their incursions with the Assyrian Empire. So this is from about three, 1000 BC all the way up until the Roman colonization of ancient Egypt. Then we have a third stream of the African diaspora. Again, this is in the this is in the pre-modern period. And these classifications are important because then you can lift up these periodizations and consider them in parallel time to other documentable world histories. So this third stream of the African diaspora in the, in the pre-modern era is what we now understand to be the spread of African people into the Indian Ocean Mediterranean world. The major point of demarcation between the pre-modern and the modern African diaspora is finally when the Europeans enter into the conversation. And this is very useful for undergraduate thinkers because from a US perspective, black history begins with enslavement. But when you're looking at the history of the African diaspora from the, um, from the from antiquity to the Bible to the Islamic lands, and I'm using Michael Gomez's formulations um, to help anchor some of the details. So Palmer gives us the periodization schema, then Butler picks it up and she asks us, how do we characterize the diaspora? Because it's not simply a timeline. So then there's a discursive experience of the African diaspora, those six characteristics that I mentioned earlier. Um, was this original group of people dispersed to two or more sites? Is it multi-generational? Is there an understanding of this homeland? Is there discrimination in the host land, right? And then uh, the, final, uh, the, final, the final essay that I use with my students is by Tiffany Patterson and Robin Kelly, Unfinished Migrations, which really helps us zoom in on what we call the Black Atlantic. Because one of the things that Palmer makes us understand is African diaspora is not synonymous with Black Atlantic because it's much older. So by having these, this trio of epistemologies, it really helps students understand, look, this 500 year window that constitutes the bulk of the histories that we write around the African diaspora, though very important, it's simply 500 years of 6,000 years of recoverable um, history. What a wonderful question and amazing answer. I also think having listened to that, like a, one of your students, why don't, um, Natalie, why don't you tell us about HSA before we go back to the office? Ah, yes. So um, thank, thank you so much for allowing me to uh, plug uh, the Haitian Studies uh, Association. Um, this is my first time hearing about uh, the Society for French Historical Studies. I'm honored to be here. And I would like to invite you all to share your understandings of uh, colonial 
um, Haiti because there is an audience that is eager to hear about this information, but because of the politics of, of financing, politics of access to the archives, Haitian study scholars may not have easy access to the archives that are the bread and butter of how you all do um, colonial Haitian history. So this is our 34th annual conference and is being held at my alma mater, Howard University, the first week of October. Um, I will be available uh, toward the end of the conference so I can share more information with you. But um, it's a fun time. Um, yes, it's a fun time and there are people who are eager to hear what is available in the French archives as it relates to Haitian studies. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. I have to add, you know, I love FHS, but at HSA, we dance. We do dance. <laughs> we dance. There's a party. Okay, okay, more questions or comments from the audience? All right, I can see that that is my friend, Dr. Kukin. Hello, Chris. Hi everyone, uh, Christy Picicaro, thank you so much for this fantastic panel and I'm so pleased that it is being recorded by H France um, so that folks who didn't make it to the conference will be able to, to listen to this panel and revisit it, uh, which I think people will do for a long time. So thank you so much. Um, I want to um, return to a theme that, that all of you ha have touched upon in, in different ways uh, and that Marlena articulated as uh, a, a question of habits of discourse. We're talking in general about habits of discourse and habits of interpretation, right? Um, and so for this crowd, as French historians and those of us uh, who work uh, on the early modern era, I think we are uh, uh, by and large coming from a French perspective, much more accustomed to thinking about uh, the, the, about Haiti as Saint-Domingue until it's not anymore. And now at several points, uh, uh, you folks have said colonial Haiti, which is not really a, a phrase I think that has as much circulation in French history as it should. And so I'm wondering uh, w w what uh, are some approaches to thinking about those habits of discourse that uh, that historians and other scholars of that colonial era should be practicing. So much of what's happening here, self-liberating individuals, we're turning so many things on their heads right now because we're realizing that the regimes of truth that have formed the way that we think about individuals and events and spaces has, uh, has been filtered through a European colonial perspective. And so as we continually work down to the tiny fine grains of how we overturn those ways of thinking and overturn those ways of speaking. Uh, you all are really leading us forward and are able to teach a whole bunch of people about, about how we can further that practice and how we can adopt practices that are maybe completely common to, uh, to discourse in the Haitian Studies Association, but that you would rarely hear uh, if not for a couple of people uh, in in French historical discourse. Thank you for that wonderful question. I will add, right, normally at FHS, we use those terms in a room full of white scholars of French saint -Domingue. You're going to, it's going to seem weird. And then there's not the background for understanding. Someone might say, colonial Haiti is an anachronistic term that, you know, Label wasn't created until 1804, uh, but as Crystal has shown us, there was this important memory of the Taino period, which is exactly why Desalines picked that name, right? To, to call the country in 1804. So I appreciate all that I learned from my colleagues about changing our terminology. Who would like to jump in on this one? Marlena, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I would say that for me, it's about um, pointing out the dynamics uh, that we are involved in. And, and I say that um, because, as Alyssa alluded to, and maybe some of you in this room know, um, the, the Napoleon op-ed piece, I can't remember, did you call it in infamous? I think you might have called it infamous. No, I was very careful. I 
called it celebrated slash infamous. <laughs> <laughs> that um, when I went to go see the Napoleon exhibit at the Grand Isle in, in La Villette um, over the summer, the, the infamous, I'll call it, the, the exhibit was infamous. Um, when I went to go and see it, I started to think about the Haitian Revolution as a counter to um, an, such an exhibit. And then I, I thought, well, I don't like the idea that you know the Haitian Revolution is like this response or it's countering, but it actually is. The Haitian Revolution literally is a response to centuries of slavery and colonialism and untold violence that if we had virtual reality would change to, to be able to go back in time to see, it would be far more horrific than anything that we are imagining based on the planter testimonies that they tell on themselves. That's what I always tell students. They actually, walking into the French archives in X is like walking into a crime scene where the victim or the, the criminals have laid out detail by detail all of their victims and every horrible thing that they did to them. Um, and so, so what I usually say is, you know, we, we are existing in this dynamic and I want to recognize it. So in my Christoph book, for example, I, ha I cannot just jump into the story and say, I'm gonna tell you about, I have to tell you about the way his life has been written about before. I have to tell you about the habits of discourse so that we will understand that the choices, that there were choices that were made along the way and all of the Christoph chroniclers is what I call them and they made choices, and that I too am going to make choices about how I narrate his life, and I have chosen to focus on what I call eyewitnesses, first person testimonies by people who knew him, some of them who loved him, some of them who hated him, because it doesn't matter what any other 20th century person said if they offered no evidence, which is the vast majority of, of the case, like he threw a baby out the window. Like, well that would be really terrible. I, if, and, and I would like to see the evidence for that. And so I think actually what Michel Montreal did in silencing the past by alerting us to the dynamic is to actually make sure that the response to it is not just, I want to pretend that it, I, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to combat it by pretending it doesn't exist and just telling the whatever story I want to tell because I think it has more weight and force. There's a reason why the Black Jacketists and silencing the past continue to be go-to books because they don't pretend that the dynamics of the silencing and framing the Haitian Revolution as a slave revolt and rebellion, which it is, but also a series of military and maneuvering and a world war, perhaps the first world war to a certain extent. So I, I, would, I want to continue to call attention to these dynamics, habits of discourse, frames of mind, fictions, as, as Natalie said, the legal fiction, the <laughs> you know, artistic fiction, and, um, and, and think about all of the realms that we are um, entering into. You know, okay, thank you, Marlena. Anyone on our panel like to mention? I mean, I'll explain the Twitter thread a little bit. Um, so this was, it's now deleted because I had to clean up my Twitter for various reasons. Um, <laughs> But I think 2018 or something. And so reflecting on Tropics of Haiti, uh, my advisor's uh, chapter on the naming of Haiti, and then also training as a Latin Americanist on where we say colonial Peru, colonial Mexico all the time um, with no one batting an eye. And then the Twitter thread was actually written uh, in an empty lecture hall after my students in the African American History Survey, which goes from, you know, African origins like thousands of years ago going through all of those different diaspora all the way up to present day and so that moment of synthesis that comes at the end of a course that went decently well um, and just making this argument of it's okay to not say San Domingue and here are the benefits we get from saying colonial Haiti um, and then I really hope you talk about the article in Age of Revolutions because Getting that as an editor, I'm like, yes, the first IUCN revolution, seeing all this stuff. Um, but it was an interesting moment taking these ideas and formulating them at the Consortium on the Revolutionary Era, where, uh, you know, this is, I felt like a very commonsensical idea when you're coming from Black Studies, when you're coming from Latin American Studies, of like, hey, if we shift these terms a little bit, we center different people, we highlight the diff different complexities, 
And there were people in the audience who were very excited. They were like, yeah, let's do this. And there were people who approached me afterwards a little scared. Um, this is why I included the cancel culture line in my talk today. Mm. But they had done all of this, what they thought was meticulous, careful research in the archives, and just fairly careful and meticulous and rooted in various things. And they were afraid that it was all just going to be like thrown out because it said San Domingue. <laughs> and it's like, no, we're going to take what insights they have and we're going to you know, put it in this different framework and build on it. This is what scholarship is, is it's a continuing conversation. Um, and so, you know, that's. I, you know, uh, Alyssa, you may have seen it on Twitter. This actually came up at a panel like right before lunch, um, where Will Little used the phrase "colonial Haiti," and the first comment from the audience was, "Why aren't you saying Saint Domingue?" Mm -hmm. um, so this is an ongoing conversation in French historical studies, um, and you know, when we think about colonial Haiti, which Will pointed out was used by the Sorc the Philadelphia, like they used Haiti all the time, right? Um, in their correspondence, it shows up. This was a common term. This is where, you know, Dessaline, it's like part of the discourse. He and other leaders were like, yeah, let's go back to this Taino past. Um, let's talk about the, avenge the vengeance and whatever else, but restoring the nation. Um, and so, you know, it's, yeah, it, it, it makes, I don't know, it makes sense and it's okay mm -hmm. to, to be doing this. Yeah, I, um, I have to say that I, I was just going to intervene and say, Rob, I saw your live tweeting the papers this morning, but I didn't see the live tweets on the Q and A, so I'm going to have to catch up on them. Okay. <laughs> How do you guys do that? <laughs> um, well, I, I think that um, uh, part of what uh, Marlene and, and what Rob, I think, are also getting at is maybe not taking for granted the um, the context and the processes by which. Uh, Haiti comes into being. So we're talking about um, you know processes of colonial conquest. We're talking about processes of racialization, of, uh, of capitalist exploitation, and these power dynamics. Um, I think coming from Black and African diaspora studies kind of gives a, um, a, a benefit or or maybe an edge in understanding that these were still human beings who were living through and surviving these processes um, rather than just being um, kind of pawns, so to speak, or, or objects, property that are kind of ancillary to the, to the story. Um, but when we make those individual people the story, I think that helps to um, unveil, these, um, un unveil these power dynamics. Um, but I think that um, Jean Casimir's recent history of the Haitian people um, in terms of these practices of reclaiming new language and processes of um, reclaiming new forms of interpretation. I mean, I think he does that beautifully um, in redefining um, redefining Haitian peasants as, as sufferers or redefining the Haitian revolution as you know, the destruction of the plantation system, uh, redefining what it means to be a sovereign people of people who are able to kind of define the direction of their lives. Um, and so I, I think that his work is really, um, really amazing in terms of um, the historical context and the, the careful analysis of history, but also, again, describing the power dynamics that um, attempt to dehumanize um, enslaved people and, and formally enslaved people and instead make them and their interests and their desires, the center of uh, the story, which then I think speaks back to uh, to power in really um, important ways. Thanks, Crystal. Natalie, do you want to come in on this one, or should we go back? Just, just really briefly. Um, I mo m most of what my thinking on this has already been said, but I w I wouldn't even say colonial Haiti. Because one of the premises of my book is I'm centering the political imaginary of a self-determined people. They are ma so um, to Gagus's uh, explanation about the naming of Haiti. Whether or not the idea came from the free people of color or not, the people who become Haitian they're making a they're making a direct political argument with the pre-colonial past and when you're looking at the physical um, boundaries on the island of IET as the Tainos understood it the colonial leaders whether 
whether they be French or Spanish, they had to, they had to um, match those pre-colonial borders because these borders are rivers, mountains. So in many ways, the farsity, what's actually ahistorical, is that temporary moment of colonialism on the island, right? So, um, th th so th that's what I would add to that. And also, when we're thinking about the advances that are th the influence of indigenous studies, and even how this conference um, market itself on the flyer information, I believe we included the indigenous name of this area on the program material. So this is something that Haitians were doing when they were founding their country. So it's wonderful that we're catching up <laughs> with the Haitian past. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm going to jump in on this one also, I think, in terms of narratives. Because I think that the Haitian narrative is really important. And I think that the Haitian narrative is really important. And I think that the Haitian narrative is really important. And I think that the Haitian narrative is really important. And I think that the Haitian narrative is really important. And I a little sideline to my real work as an intellectual historian or a historiographer. But in fact, the reason I'm doing this is exactly to get at what Christie asked about discourses. What are habits of talking about Haiti that are common uh, among non-Haitians? Building on Leo and silencing the past. And more importantly, how do Haitians remember their own revolution? So that's one of the central questions of my book, um, which starts off by looking at foreign films and then a failed attempt to make films of the Haitian Revolution. But then my chapters on Haitian films on the Haitian Revolution, even if they're hard to access and they're lower budget, what do Haitians think about their revolution? What is the oral history of the memory and the meaning of the Haitian Revolution today to Haitians as opposed to us? who might stop in 1804 when the revolution is over and say, well, we're not interested anymore because it's not France. Mm -hmm. and, right? What's the legacy today in the 21st century? So that's one of the things that I did uh, um, try to get at in this book. And it's one reason that I've shifted to studying all the 20th and 21st century Haiti to understand what happens afterwards. All right, I see the audience again. Um, I think we have six minutes left. So I think we have time for a last question or comment that we'll answer briefly. Alyssa, can I, can I add something? Please. Um, so, uh, I, I, I understand um, the practice of French historians. Once it becomes independent, we leave it, right? But as I was preparing my remarks for this panel, I went back to a collection of essays by Tocqueville. Right, and he has this uh, essay. Um, I don't remember the title of the essay, but it's something akin to "We're Bad at Keeping Colonies." Right. One of the more popular Tocqueville essays is the one about democracy in America. But I I, I revisited that essay um, because Tocqueville is actually uh, he's not talking too much about colonial. Saint-Domingue, but he's expressing the anxieties of Frenchmen who were existing after the loss of Haiti. And if historical subjects in that period are having anxieties about the loss of Haiti, I think it would behoove French historians to see how other thinkers in um, 19th century France are thinking about the loss of the Haitian colony and how it informs the colonization of Algeria. So um, one, um, one of the brilliant uh, books that does this really well is uh, Susan Buck Moore's uh, Hegel in Haiti, where she's making us look at this prominent thinker and how um, they're engaging with Haiti, but not engaging with Haiti by not naming it. And I think that when I looked at that Tocqueville essay in it, I don't know if I'm right. Am I pronouncing his name correctly? Okay, yeah, okay. Um, I, never, I never actually have to um, engage with France in this way. But 
he's expressing a lot of anxieties about the loss of Haiti without naming Haiti. And if someone that prominent and his insights about the loss of this major colony on the cusp of the colonization of Algeria, I wonder how many other prominent French thinkers during the 19th century are also thinking about the loss of this colony, but not naming it. Um, so perhaps French historians need to look at how French subjects are dealing in the post-colonial Haitian moment um, for new ways to engage with this, uh, with this subject. Uh, thank you, Natalie. I feel obliged to jump in because otherwise that I have been, uh, that I've oversimplified. A, one of my favorite phrases, il faut pas exagérer. So we do have colleagues who Robin Mitchell looked at what the loss of Haiti meant in her new book. Mary Lewis is also looking at the loss of Haiti. Um, and our colleague in Korea, we have colleagues in Korea who study France and Haiti, Ayumi Kwan also worked on this, the kind of nostalgia um, and efforts by colonists to get their money back. But in general, right, at FHS, people, uh, it's often after 1804. All right, we have two minutes left if we have anything final from our audience. Oh, so while we were thinking, I, w I was just going to point out that the um, Haitian Revolutionary Fictions anthology that you showed, the vast majority of fictions of the Haitian Revolution are by French writers, mm -hmm. all the way up to 1899. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the indemnity, but it's also a historical to stop at 1804. Uh, Fermat is on the other side of the island because Santo Domingo is still French. Mm -hmm. um, you still have, then the French try to reap the island at various points in the 1810s. In the 1820s and 1830s, ex-French colonists are directly saying, we can't wait to go restore, restaurer la colonie, which always means to bring back slavery. Every French king is, is involved in this. Uh, in 1838 is when the indemnity is repackaged. Um, then of course we have the banks. That, so it's not, it's historical from the perspective of facts that France was done with Haiti mm -hmm. after 1804, but it's also historical from the perspective of discourse. Because as I mentioned, I mean, even the fictional imagination is so strong that you still have French authors producing. I mean, it would be the equivalent of in the United States if we produced nine novels in one year about the US Civil War, but it's like 18, you know, I mean, even the 19th century. Um, and that there, there's one year where right after the indemnity, there's nine French novels or short stories published and a bunch of poems, a bunch of engravings about the Haitian Revolution. It's kind of astonishing. And what's more, the Saint-Domingue related anxiety uh, goes throughout Pierre Vassier's Saint-Domingue, which is like a 1908 production, uh, you know, this history of the island, where he's very much saying, look, colonialism and imperialism are not gonna be easy. They're gonna be very complicated, very messy. Here's, let's look at this history. Whereas Charles Frostin's Les Petits Bruns is really about Algeria, um, using the official correspondence to think through the Algerian War of Independence. Um, so yeah, no, the, the, anxi the anxiety and the obsession uh, carry, carry through. Thank you so much, Rob. Okay, so I see at the clock there was 12.45 my time, which is 3.45 your time. Um, I know that the people in the set next session probably want the room, um, but I'm bummed because normally I can stay and linger in the room <laughs> from you or see you in the hallway. So I'm gonna thank everyone and maybe we just keep the zoom open. I'm so grateful that H Trans recorded it so that more people, um, as Christy said, will be able to just we try to explain some things that maybe aren't often said here, and I'm so grateful um, to Crystal, to Rob, to Natalie, and to Marlena for coming and talking to us. So thank you so much.